During the last decade, our fragile dependence on imported oil has brought a new focus on planning for a more secure energy future. At the same time, rapid addition of pollutants and greenhouse gases to the atmosphere over the past century has raised fears that the burning of fossil fuels will lead to a drastic rise in global temperature. These concerns have led to renewed interest in energy gases, particularly natural gas, the cleanest burning and least polluting of all fossil fuels. Gases have unique properties. They are light, they flow easily. Under pressure, they compress and take up less space, but expand instantly when released. When cooled, they contract, and when heated, they expand, and some of them burn. These are the ones we call energy gases. Two hundred years ago, wood fueled our homes and businesses. Thick forests covered the land, and timber stood at our doorsteps. But as a fledgling steel industry grew, it devoured immense amounts of wood. Two acres of trees were burned to produce the charcoal needed to smelt one ton of iron. Forests began to disappear, and wood prices soared. Coal began to fuel railroads and an expanding industrialized society. It was cheaper, cleaner burning, and more compact. Still, coal is bulky and expensive to transport, so early industrial development was limited primarily to the coal-bearing regions in the eastern United States. After the discovery of oil in Pennsylvania in the 1860s and the later Texas oil boom that began in 1901, the more convenient liquid fuels caught the public's attention, and demand grew rapidly. When the automobile captured our vision and imagination, the future importance of oil was assured, and then guaranteed further by the advent of air transportation. Oil and gasoline underwrote an unprecedented worldwide industrial expansion and two world wars. Today, our economy runs on oil a commodity of immense strategic importance that fires international tensions while it fuels our society. We seem to have reached a critical point in our energy history. We're dependent on foreign oil, uncertain about the effect of fossil fuels on the atmosphere and our health, and struggling to find a balanced energy policy. To plot our way through this maze of problems that confront us, more than anything, we need clear information. Here, our focus is on energy gases, particularly natural gas, methane, a fuel that may help us move into a cleaner and more secure energy future. Over the past 200 years, we've replaced each dominant energy source, first wood, then coal with a newer, cleaner, and more convenient fuel. We may well be in the early stages of yet another transition, this time from oil to natural gas. Natural gas now accounts for about 25% of our energy needs. 50 million families and 4 million businesses rely on natural gas for fuel. Natural gas also provides the intense heat needed for industrial processes. And vehicle fleets throughout the United States are being converted to natural gas. Cars can be easily and safely operated on natural gas with revisions to the fuel system. And natural gas storage cylinders that are virtually indestructible. But natural gas brings new questions to an energy marketplace that has experienced two decades of periodic disruption and confusion. What is natural gas? How does it form? Where do we find it? How much is there? What will it cost? And how will it affect the environment? Natural gas occurs throughout the Earth's crust 
It is not simply a byproduct of oil, as many of us assume. It is actually a fuel in its own right, different from oil in its occurrence, its properties as a gas, and in its origin. Oil occurs mainly at depths less than 10,000 feet, and always in association with natural gas. But natural gas occurs to depths of at least 40,000 feet often on its own, but also in association with coal and even dissolved in hot brine. Natural gas is forming today in landfills from the breakdown of organic materials and is even found lodged within the crystal structure of ice. Methane is the main component of natural gas. This simple compound contains less carbon and fewer impurities than coal or oil and burns more cleanly than either. Most importantly, burning natural gas produces less carbon dioxide, a major contributor to the greenhouse effect and potential global warming. Burning natural gas also adds fewer nitrogen compounds and almost no sulfur to the atmosphere resulting in less of the acid rain and acid fog that are produced from the combustion of oil and coal. Like oil, natural gas is formed from organic materials contained in rocks. When these rocks are heated slowly in the earth or more rapidly in a test tube, the organic material breaks down, forming oil and natural gas. Unlike oil, however, natural gas is also produced from organic matter by the work of archaebacteria. These organisms occur in the earth almost everywhere that oxygen is absent, at least to temperatures of 97 degrees centigrade. Most oil and natural gas originate from the decomposition of plant materials that accumulate in lakes, marshes, and along the shores of oceans. At shallow depths, archaeas produce methane from these plant remains, sometimes in large amounts. As the sediment layers are buried, temperature rises. At depths of about two miles, heat begins to break the chemical bonds of organic molecules, forming oil and natural gas. As burial continues, temperature rises still higher. Oil becomes unstable, and only natural gas forms. Pushed by pressure and buoyancy, the oil and natural gas travel from their source, moving through the earth at perhaps a few inches per year. Some is trapped by dense layers of impermeable rock called seals. If enough pore space is available beneath the seal, a rich deposit of oil and gas may develop. Most oil and gas never gets trapped. Some remains in the source, while the rest moves to the surface. Natural gas enters the atmosphere, and oil turns to tar, or is decomposed by microorganisms. Much of the natural gas we have found was discovered during the intense ongoing search for oil. This oil-associated natural gas is known as a conventional resource, because it can be tapped using standard techniques. Recent estimates by the National Petroleum Council show that we have at least 775 trillion cubic feet of conventional natural gas available to us in the United States. Forty years supply, if we burn it at the rate we do today. These conventional resources represent only a part of the natural gas that's available to us. Natural gas also occurs in places that are more difficult to develop, and more expensive to produce. These occurrences known as unconventional resources include tight gas, coal bed methane, deep gas, and methane hydrates. Together, these have the potential of providing large amounts of natural gas for the future. Tight gas occurs in rocks like the massive sandstones that form the cliffs of Mesa Verde National Park in southwestern Colorado. Farther south, these same layers lie buried beneath thousands of feet of rock in the San Juan Basin. Here, they house vast stores of natural gas, but hold it tightly locked in isolated cells. 
pores in these tight gas reservoirs are unconnected, like holes in a Swiss cheese, or linked only by microscopic cracks. The gas moves slowly through the rock, or not at all, making it difficult to collect. But large natural fractures crack open the pore space, freeing the gas. Zones of intensely fractured rock form concentrations of natural gas. New technologies let drillers pierce these zones horizontally, tapping several from a single well and making the difficult job of recovery more efficient. Tight gas sandstones hold immense quantities of natural gas but much of it may be too expensive or even impossible to recover. Yet recent estimates suggest that tight gas might supply 400 trillion cubic feet of natural gas, enough to meet our present needs for 20 years. Coal bed methane, a useful resource, was once seen only as a deadly threat to miners. At just the right mix with air, at the slightest spark or flame, the gas explodes. Canaries once warned miners of dangerous gas concentrations. More recently, giant fans have been used to ventilate mines, greatly reducing the chance of explosions. Now, coal bed methane is being captured for use as a fuel. In Alabama, where coal is being mined underground, Holes are drilled to the top of a coal seam long before a new mine section is opened. Water is pumped from the coal to lower pressure and release methane. The gas moves to the surface, where it's compressed and delivered to a pipeline. Capturing methane also lowers the hazard for mining that follows and reduces the quantity released into the atmosphere. Methane is also produced from coals that are not mined underground. In northern New Mexico, the La Plata mine fuels the San Juan power plant. But 15 miles east of the mine, and several thousand feet below the surface, this coal bed delivers natural gas to wells that first tapped its potential in 1978, becoming the first coal bed methane produced in the United States. Some 1,700 wells have now produced about 40 billion cubic feet of natural gas from this coal. Coal bed methane is a relatively new resource, and the amount ultimately available in the United States is uncertain. Our best estimates now indicate about 90 trillion cubic feet, or four to five years supply added to our natural gas reserves. Deep gas comes from wells that pierce the crust to depths of over 15,000 feet. Some penetrate over five miles into the earth. The extreme pressures at these depths require massive wellheads to contain their potentially destructive force. The searing heat of deep gases, sometimes more than 300 degrees centigrade, must be cooled before the gas can enter a pipeline. Hundreds of deep wells have been completed, and they've tapped large accumulations of natural gas, but they are difficult to drill and expensive to complete. Low prices for natural gas have slowed development, and the extent of the resource is unclear. At present, we can't predict how much deep gas might be available, but its potential remains enticing. This is not ordinary ice. It is gas hydrate, a type of ice that burns. It is also the most abundant form of methane on Earth. In gas hydrates, methane molecules are caged in a lattice of frozen water. A large amount of gas can be stored in a very small volume of ice. Melting a cubic meter of hydrate releases up to 170 cubic meters of methane gas. Natural gas hydrates are found throughout the world. They occur abundantly in ocean floor sediments and in the permafrost of polar regions. These vast deposits contain huge amounts of methane. But gas hydrates are not included in estimates of resources. 
because we don't yet know if we will ever be able to use them. Work is now underway to understand this unique material and add it to our future energy supplies. If developed, natural gas from hydrates would last us for centuries. An almost limitless source of methane might be available if one very radical hypothesis proves correct. This idea suggests that natural gas and oil come from materials containing carbon that accumulated during the formation of the planet. According to this theory, combinations of these materials present throughout the Earth migrate upward into the crust where they deposit gas and oil. But geologists generally reject the idea of huge concentrations of methane coming from deep within the Earth. Nevertheless, it has attracted millions of dollars to drill deep test wells into granites in Sweden, rocks that are unlikely to contain organically derived gas or oil. Small amounts of methane and other hydrocarbons have been found, but their origin is uncertain, and the validity of the hypothesis remains unclear. Certainly knowing something about the origin and occurrence of natural gas can better help us understand discussions of domestic energy policy. But as consumers who depend upon energy would really like to know how far into the future these supplies will be available and at what cost. The U.S. Geological Survey and other organizations regularly make forecasts regarding the amount of oil and gas that remains undiscovered, both within the United States and throughout the world. Estimating the amount of a resource hidden in the earth is a little like guessing the number of jelly beans in a very large jar. Even if you could count the ones you see, there's all that stuff in the middle that's jumbled up and out of sight. But the jelly beans filled the jar, while natural gas is only scattered through the earth's crust, making resource estimation even more difficult than jelly bean guessing. Information is limited to the production histories of known gas fields and basins, and the new discoveries that come online. But we must also consider the natural gas that lies still untouched, and estimating this requires an educated guess. Through the years, the careful procedures of resource estimators have tended to underestimate the amount of natural gas available for our use. Widely accepted estimates of natural gas resources now project an available supply in the United States of 1,200 to 1,500 trillion cubic feet, or TCF. Today, we use about 20 TCF per year. So there's enough natural gas available to fulfill present needs for about 75 years. If we used 40 TCF per year, double the present rate, Supplies would last nearly 40 years. And remember, these are conservative estimates and don't take into account the potential supplies of deep gas or gas hydrates. But it is not quite this simple because supplies of natural gas are in part related to price. As price increases, producers will put more money into development of resources, coal bed methane or tight gas, for example that were once unprofitable. So as price rises and sources that were once uneconomic begin to be developed, more natural gas becomes available. There is, of course, a limit to this increase. But the development of natural gas is at an early stage, and the upper limits of supply are still not known. With energy resources, however, factors other than supply and demand also come into play. And some, such as the indirect costs resulting from atmospheric pollution, are tricky to deal with. Some indirect costs of burning fossil fuels are included in the price we pay for energy. The cost to an electric utility or manufacturer for reducing the emissions from a factory or power plant is included in the price we pay for electricity and consumer goods. The cost to a coal company of restoring strip mines and making the land productive once again is passed on in the price paid for coal. But what of the costs that are not included in the price we pay? 
What are the costs, for instance, of health problems such as asthma, emphysema, and heart disease that are aggravated by smog and ozone produced by cars, trucks, and planes? What of the cost of environmental damage from oil spills and acid rain? What of the more easily understood costs of highway maintenance and repair? The most of us don't associate these various costs with our energy bills. We pay for them nonetheless. Some are hidden in today's costs for health care, farm products, and manufactured goods. Some we pay for through fuel taxes. Other costs, however, will not come due for years or even decades. The most important of these may be the economic consequences of climatic change, resulting from the buildup of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Carbon dioxide in the atmosphere absorbs heat that is radiated from the Earth. Instead of moving out into space, much of this heat is radiated back to the surface. This process has moderated Earth's temperature for hundreds of millions of years, making it habitable. But if the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere increases dramatically, this delicate equilibrium could shift, and global temperature might begin to rise significantly. Our present understanding of atmospheric change and global warming is by no means complete. Nevertheless, records contained in ice up to 250,000 years old from the Greenland ice sheet does show that carbon dioxide has been accumulating in the atmosphere at an extraordinary rate for the past century. If this rate of increase continues, many scientists believe that it will lead to significant global warming. Such change could cause a shift of major agricultural belts that might turn existing farmland into deserts. Melting of polar ice caps might flood coastal cities and displace large populations. These potential dangers and the indirect costs that result from energy use suggest that we should at least bring clear and careful consideration to our energy choices. Burning natural gas compared with other fossil fuels does add smaller amounts of carbon dioxide and other compounds to the atmosphere. A methane-fueled car emits about 25% less carbon dioxide, 40% less nitrogen oxides, 45% less of the compounds that create smog, and 85% less carbon monoxide compared to an average gasoline-fueled vehicle. In electrical power generation, a natural gas-fueled combined cycle plant will emit 50% less carbon dioxide, 95% less nitrogen oxides, and 100% less sulfur oxides than a scrubbed coal-fueled plant. These comparisons indicate that increased use of natural gas would let us begin the process of reducing the amount of carbon dioxide and other pollutants added to the atmosphere. But the utilization of natural gas does have other consequences. When leaked into the atmosphere, methane contributes significantly to the greenhouse effect and might intensify global warming. Evidence indicates that the amount of methane in the atmosphere has doubled during the past 150 years of population growth and economic development. This is a little deceptive, however, as atmospheric methane comes from a variety of sources. Gas seeps and wetlands account for about one-third of the methane presently added to the atmosphere. This is the natural and continuing flow of methane from the Earth that has been taking place for millions of years. The two-thirds that's increasing comes from human activities. Agriculture, particularly rice cultivation and cattle raising, produces one half of this. The final third comes from oil and natural gas activities, coal mines, landfills, and the breakdown of debris from clearing forests. As energy use increases worldwide, potential leakage during transportation of liquefied natural gas by tanker from gas fields in Russia Algeria, Nigeria, and Venezuela will become an additional source of atmospheric methane. If use of natural gas is to help reduce the potential danger of atmospheric change and global warming, 
leakage from all sources worldwide will have to be kept to a small percentage of the total amount used. Measures to limit methane generated by human activities are underway. Natural gas distribution and transmission lines are being improved. Coal bed methane is being captured for use as a fuel, and methane extracted from landfills is being added to city fuel supplies or used to generate electricity. Natural gas also comes with a land use price tag. Presently, our supplies come from some 240,000 wells. At least 20,000 wells will need to be drilled each year to maintain present production. Even more may be needed if we are to fully utilize the 1,300 trillion cubic feet that is now available. While natural gas wells can be very unobtrusive, networks of access roads cut across the land. To really improve the condition of the atmosphere, even natural gas would need to be replaced in a few decades by a cleaner energy mix. This might include increased use of renewable resources, and even nuclear fusion. Or it might mean using hydrogen, which powers this experimental car. Hydrogen, however, does not occur naturally in large quantities and would have to be produced from water or even methane using energy from renewable resources. Some experts think that new, clean-burning coal technologies will fuel society for centuries. But no matter what fuel we decide to use, most energy analysts agree that increased efficiency and conservation must play a more significant role in energy planning. We need to remember that atmospheric pollution from energy generation and use is a global problem. A view of the Earth at night reflects the massive amount of energy we consume and the uneven distribution of its use. Right now, 20% of the world's population uses 70% of all energy. What will happen when the population doubles over the next 40 years and energy use in developing countries expands to feed growing economies? The U.S. Geological Survey and other organizations are now approaching these and similar vital questions through a broad variety of projects from field mapping to laboratory experiments and computer modeling. Some people maintain that our future well-being depends on critical decisions involving energy use and its effects on the environment. Others suggest that our concerns for the environment, especially involving uncertain factors such as climatic change, are exaggerated. Wasn't it Yogi Berra who once said that what gets us in trouble is not what we don't know. It's what we know for sure that just ain't so. Perhaps we need to take a look at what we seem to know, as well as those factors that we don't know about energy resources. If we do, we may well find that a secure and clean energy future is within our grasp.